In 1803, France was at war with Britain. Prime Minister William Pitt spent 1804 and 5 in a flurry of diplomatic activity to build a new coalition against France. In April 1805, Russia joined the now Third Coalition. They were later joined by Austria, Sweden and Naples. In late September, General Mack, in charge of the Austrian army in Bavaria, set up around Ulm, with a plan to block the gaps through the mountainous Black Forest region. Meanwhile, Napoleon's army was moving rapidly towards him. Napoleon wanted to isolate this army before the Russians could arrive to support it. Mack assumed the French would not break Prussian neutrality, but soon learned that Bernadotte's first corps had marched through Prussian territory to the north. Rather than retreat from his position, he elected to stay and defend all. This decision allowed Napoleon's army to envelop Mack. The Austrians did attempt several breakouts, but were overall unsuccessful. So at Ulm, on the 20th of October, Mack surrendered with around 25,000 troops to Napoleon. In less than 15 days, the Austrians had lost 60,000 men and Napoleon had inflicted a crushing blow to the Third Coalition. But the Russians still had powerful forces in the field, and with Prussia threatening to join the coalition, Napoleon needed a quick victory. After the disastrous defeat at all, the remaining Austrians under Kynmir and the newly arrived Russian army under Kutuzov began retreating towards Vienna, fighting several rearguard actions against the advancing French. The Allies headed towards Brune, where another Russian force under Buxhauden was located. They were also joined by the Austrian Emperor Francis and Tsar Alexander. Napoleon, knowing he needed to draw the Allies into battle, did this by ordering Bernadotte and de Voot to hold back while the rest of his 53,000 men pushed forward, trying to invite the Allies to attack the smaller force. The Allies took the bait, and as they advanced, Napoleon ordered Salt to abandon the Pratzen Heights with haste. This gave the Allies an impression that the French were weak. Napoleon also opened channels to discuss an armistice. These ruses drew the Allies into a major battle, which would take place on the 2nd of December 1805, the Battle of the Three Emperors otherwise known as the Battle of Austerlitz. The Allied plan was to overwhelm the thin French right flank and then envelop the centre. Little did they know, Napoleon was relying on his weak right flank luring the Allies into just such an attack. The French centre under assault would then launch a massive attack against the Allied centre on the Pratzen Heights, splitting the Allied army in half. The battle begins in the early morning hours, with a heavy mist covering the battlefield, leaving a large portion of the French army hidden to the Austro-Russian forces at the top of the high ground of the Pratzen Heights. The battle opens at around 7.30am, with several Allied columns moving off the Pratzen Heights to engage the thin French right flank, but as Napoleon had planned, de Vu's hard marching corps arrived to shore up the French wing. Davout's counter-attack manages to force the Austrians on the far wing to retreat, allowing the French to take up defensive positions along the stream. The Grand's division, facing the brunt of the Russian attacks, holds off several divisions for almost an hour, until two fresh divisions force them back, leaving a large hole in the French line. Napoleon, realising the danger of this threat, immediately orders Murat to lead forward Kellerman's light cavalry division for a counter-attack. While in the centre, Salt's attack on the Pratzen Heights begins, as skirmishing breaks out between St. Hilaire's light infantry and the Russian musketeers of the third column. In the homebrew set of rules I'm using today, movement is done based on orders, which take at least a turn to send or change. This comes into play as the French cavalry received this order late, but the Russian breakthrough around Sokolnik suffers a delay due to them crossing the stream. This slows them down enough to allow the French cavalry to force them back before they can destroy Le Grand's disorganised division, allowing it to reform for a counter-attack.
with the Allied army being bogged down on their left and attacked in the centre on the Pratzen Heights, Napoleon orders Lene to launch an assault against Bagration's right wing. As you can see here, Lene has six infantry bases, representing around 2,500 men each, or roughly six brigades, split into two divisions. They both have orders. The front is on an attack order, which means all units must move as quickly as possible towards their target, in this case, the small village of Bolsonets occupied by Russian musketeers. The second division is on a support order, which allows for more flexibility, being able to switch between attack or defend order without having to go through an order change, giving the commander a lot of tactical flexibility. The French light cavalry managed to push the advancing Russians back across the stream with heavy losses. The fighting in the centre continues as the Russians put up stiff resistance, but Salt's exceptional divisional commanders Saint Hilaire and Van Damme slowly wear down the Russian centre. My interpretation of this scale of game leans heavily towards how important command is, not just in sending orders but also in the tactical ability of these generals and how they have to use their initiative, from the army level way down to brigade level. So divisional commanders in this game not only affect orders but also combat modifiers. Though the armies may be similar size, in this regard the French are vastly superior to their Austro-Russian enemies. This map shows the positions at around 10am, as combat occurs across most of the battlefield. The fighting on the French right wing dies out as the Allies fall back to reorganise their divisions. In the centre, a Russian division is forced back and the Imperial Guard is forced to plug the gap. As the battle intensifies on the Pratzen Heights, Napoleon senses this is a crucial moment and launches his 4,000 elite cuirassier to deliver the final blow. What started as just a probing attack to put pressure on Bagration's wing turns into a breakthrough as Shusei's division pushes the Russians back. This could prove disastrous for the Austro-Russian army as their line of retreat could be blocked off by the French. In the centre, the Russians, getting more and more desperate, launch their guard cavalry into the fray as the Imperial Guard engage a French elite infantry. To the French rear, the French crashes begin moving up to the Pratton Heights. And after almost an hour of delays, the Allied left wing, crucial to their plan, finally begin to move again. But is it too late? Just before 11 o'clock, the last few Russian infantry brigades on the Pratson Heights are broken and flee from the field, though the stoic Imperial Guard remain. But things get worse for Kutuzov in the centre, as now his Guard cavalry are threatened on their flank by French cuirassiers. Lene, seeing this huge opportunity to cut the Allied line of retreat, orders his 2nd Division to attack Bagratin's remaining infantry. This battle doesn't last long as these men begin to rout from the field in the face of this fresh attack. In the centre, the Russian Imperial Guard, now flanked by cavalry, flee from the field, a devastating blow to Russian morale, which ends any hopes of holding the Pratzen Heights. The final hope for the Allied army is to break the weak French right flank. But Davu, one of Napoleon's finest generals, sets up a stoic defence and the Russians fail to break through. With their centre and right flank completely destroyed, the remaining Allied forces face being encircled. The sudden sight of French infantry marching towards their rear is terrifying, and many Russians break and attempt to save themselves. Much like the historic battle, this is a catastrophic defeat for the Third Coalition. Grand Armée is victorious, losing around 8,176 casualties compared to the huge Allied losses of around 27,578, over three times Napoleon's losses. Overall, a very similar result to the real battle fought over 200 years ago. 22 days later, the Austrians signed the Treaty of Pressburg, effectively ending the Third Coalition. But Russia still had powerful armies in the field 
and Prussia was getting ever closer to joining the war. The war of the Third Coalition may be over, but the Napoleonic Wars was only just beginning. Thanks for watching this refart of the Battle of Austerlitz, I hope you enjoyed. If you've got any questions or suggestions, just leave them in the comments, I'll try and get back to you. And hopefully I'll see you in the next one.